welcome to New Hampshire's Wild Side. I'm Christina Lupi. And I'm Mark Beauchene. We'll take you behind the scenes of the New Hampshire Fish and Game Department to learn more about the people and projects of your Fish and Wildlife Agency. We'll also give you tips and tactics that you can use to make the most out of your time in New Hampshire's woods and waters. And along the way, we'll meet real people who love life outdoors. Now, let's discover more about New Hampshire's Wild Side. Tusk are actually really active in the winter. They spawn in the winter as well. Unlike most fish that are kind of pseudo dormant in the winter, cusk are very, very active and they're seeking out food to eat and actual areas to spawn as well too. They like rocky bottoms. So we're on a rocky shoal right here and it's close to uh, the deep water. I like to like drill all my holes first and then come back through and I can just drop my lines real quick. And I kind of like to get all my, my true cusk, cusk lines in the water first and then before the sun goes down and that way when the sun goes down you're already ready and you're there chicken ready. So with your, your cusk lines, by law, they have the weight has to be resting on bottom, and it's got to be the weight's got to be over an ounce, and the the length between the weight and the hook can't be over six inches. And you also can't um, can't give it any motion. Like you can't come over here and like start jigging them like you would uh, for lake trout. It's just a bucktail jig. This one has glow paint on it. You can charge it up with a flashlight and then I'm going to send it down and just using a pretty stout rod right here and I actually use um, braid similar to what you'd use bass fishing. So like 20 pound braid, pretty, pretty heavy stuff and I use about a 15 pound heavy duty monofilament leader. Again, nice stout setup and then what I'm doing here is I'm just going to take this jig and I'm just bouncing it right down the rocks. One of their favorite foods is crayfish too so um, when you bang it down on the bottom like this too they're rooting around. Uh, looking for food and crayfish and I have this tipped with a uh, piece of cut bait. I am using a dead uh, medium shiner right now. Sun has just set about 25 minutes ago and we have all of our cusk lines out in the water. We're gonna go around and uh, check them. If you're gonna check it or move it around, you need to pull the line completely up out of the water and then send it back down. Feels like I got something on here. You feel very big. I feel something on there. I think I got a small cusk. Yep, small cusk. Right there. that go ice fishing really don't cusk fish and they really don't know that when they're walking off the ice at the end of the day the action is really just getting uh, just getting going and they're fantastic table fare. A lot of people call them uh, freshwater scallops. It's actually a member of the cod family. Oh yeah I got one on here. This one's pulling pretty good here. on here. What do we got here? Oh, that's a nice eater. <laughs> Look at 
Look at the colors on that one, huh? Isn't that beautiful? Use the hashtag better outside when you share photos and videos showing how you connect with life outdoors. And don't forget to tag New Hampshire Fish and Game on Facebook and Instagram. We're gonna tie the purple smelt uh, fly pattern. It's an old New Hampshire pattern that was originated by a fly tire from the Keene, New Hampshire area named Ora Smith. The first step of this is to choose your hook. This is a size four and it's 9x. I think for most New Hampshire smelt, this is gonna get you about at the right length of it. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start and I'm gonna put some white thread for a base. And the reason we use white thread is we're gonna be putting some floss on this. And if we use the dark color thread underneath the floss, when it gets wet, the floss would change its color. And one of the things that you can see me do every about 10 wraps as I counterclockwise spin my thread and it opens the fibers of the thread up and it results in a really smooth body. The next step I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put on my ribbing and the material for my tag. I take the short end towards the rear of the fly, I sandwich the two gold ends together, I rotate it and I can pull that right up. It locked right into place. And I'm just gonna wrap back on this two wraps and then wrap forward a couple quick, maybe three wraps. The next part of the fly is the floss body. And the floss body is calls for a fluorescent red. Floss I'm using here today is four strand. What I wanna do is I wanna just use two of the strands. Now one of the things that I'm gonna do, and you'll watch, is as I go up, I'm still gonna spin my thread counterclockwise. And I'm gonna keep that tag end, that waist end, on the underside of the hook. And one of the tricks is you can move right along going up that shank and you're locking everything in at this point. You're locking in the floss and you're locking in the mylar at the same time. And just about, oh, I'd say about an eighth of an inch from the top, I'm gonna reach in and just snip off the waist. Make sure I got all the little pieces off there. And then I'm just gonna wind it right up. And you can see where I stop here, I've stopped at, you know, maybe a wooden match head's distance back from the eye. It's good to have a landmark like that because it's important to make sure that you don't um, bring your thread too far forward because when you try to finish the fly off, you won't have enough room for all the rest of the material. So one of the things that I do is I stroke all this material straight up and it kind of flattens the fibers and I make my first turn right at the junction of where that tag ended. And then I slowly work my way up. I don't have much waste there, but it's, got an, it's covered that really well. So now I'm gonna rib this and I want to kind of rib it up so that I have equal space in my ribs. And usually on a 9X hook like this, we're looking at anywhere between 8 and 11 equal wraps. And then I tie it off. One of the things with bucktail is when you um, choose the bucktail for the throat, you, def you definitely want to look at the, s the area right in here between my fingers, on, on either side. Down here, they're, they're very coarse and hollow and kind of uh, um, thicker. And up at the top, they're really thin and sometimes they're brittle at the top. So we, we choose bucktail from this middle area here. And you can see this one's picked pretty good. And then I always change my scissors. I don't use the same scissors to cut coarse material as I do the rest of the fly. I'm gonna kind of cull out any of the small pieces. And then I'm gonna stack these. I, you can hand stack them. You could kind of line up your, 
your tips and do a little maneuvering kind of gymnastics with the with the hair but you can you can achieve the same thing by using a hair stacker and it put all the tips right down the bottom then what I do is I point the butt end, the bottom end towards the rear of the fly that way when I pull the material out it's orientated the way I want it one of the things that you want is you want to use your bucktail you want this to be really sparse so what I've done is I've measured this from the tie-in spot and I want it to come just right where the barb of the hook is so I cut it off and then one of the tricks that you can do with bucktail that really can make the bucktail adhere better the bucktail is hollow and when you apply it it likes to compress and it likes to roll on the um, when you tie it in so what I just did was took a little bit, a tiny bit of head cement and coated the tips. And it's so sparse that I can actually grab this whole bunch of bucktail with my first wrap. And now you see you've got a nice throat underneath it. It's tapered. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna um, make my move and I'm gonna tie off with a two turn whip finish and I'm gonna switch the black because the head calls for black. So now, again, I'm gonna put my black thread on, wind it up, cut off the piece of waste, and now I'm ready to work on my wings. Now, the wings are made up of saddle. Saddle comes from a rooster, and um, we're using a color of saddle. This, this particular saddle right here is from Ewing. They, it's a lavender color. It's very hard to find lavender. We got to measure out our wing here and we want our wing to to extend beyond the bend of the hook and I'm gonna see that that's lined up. It's not sticking out too far. It should be fairly good and uh, it should result in a, a streamlined wing. And I pull the fibers away and then I'm just gonna tear all that material and even them up on both sides. So what I've done is I just kind of reached in with my bodkin and I pulled away from the side. And then all I'm gonna do with this is gonna trim it off so I have something to work with. The um, trick with these is I'm gonna take each one of these, I'm gonna use that first one as the, as the template. But I want the tips to be right lined up as, as close to even as I possibly can. This is a fabric fusion. You get this at the, the local fabric store. It holds patches on. It, fi it fixes uh, little rips in your clothes and different things like that. And what we do is coat the, the wing just on the stem, a little bit into the fiber and a little bit into the bare stem. And I sandwich them together. Option one is that I can tie all four wings in at once. Option two is I can tie one wing in, um, one pair of wings in per side individually. And uh, it, it often depends. I'm gonna lay it up there and get one or two quick wraps on it. Now it's pretty much in place. Then I'm gonna line up the, the butts so they're all pretty much lined up. And then I'm gonna tie the other two in. So now if you look at that, you can see that looks, it should look like it's close to being one feather all bunched together. And then I, I'm gonna lock those wings in and I'm in good shape there. The next part is a cheek. And the cheek on this fly is teal. And uh, teal is really good because I personally think whenever I am struggling fly fishing in New Hampshire and I'm not getting any action when I'm using a streamer, if I switch to something that has teal, I usually get some results and it covers the front side of it. It's about probably maybe a third of the distance from the head to the uh, very back of the streamer feathers. Again, I lock these down. If 
for the eyes. We're gonna use this material, it's called a jungle cock or jungle fowl, whatever you wanna refer to it as. It's a bird that um, used to be readily available. It's not now, it's hard to find the material. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna strip off carefully because these stems can be a little problematic and can kind of split a little bit on you and then you don't really get a good tie-in spot they're not anchored in there very well so i'm going to set up both of these eyes this was always done by um, tires who wanted people to come back and buy their flies they would adhere the eye to the cheek and so I'm going to do that with this. I'm just put a little of that fabric fusion on the back side of this eye. And I'm going to lay it right in place. And you can see that's right in there nice. And on this one, I kind of run it up the, the stem. So all those stems are, for the most part, all in line. You could, you could run it so that the eye was on the shank, so it was parallel to the shank. So now I've locked these in, they're in good shape. Now it comes down to um, the process of snipping all the waist off and finishing the head. I try to snip off the, the pieces in order. Remember the four initial rods of the, of the, um, of the saddle hackle, they're, they're tied in pretty good now. So now we get down to the last four rods and I kind of bend them at 90 degrees and then I snip them off. And I'm gonna finish this head off. And the way to finish a streamer head is to start up behind the eye and work back. And what you're doing is you're covering everything and you're building a nice bullet shaped head. And usually with a streamer like this, I want to have a fairly decent sized eye. So now I'm going to whip finish. And when I whip finish, I start in the middle and I wind my whip finish towards the eye. And I just wiggle it, make sure it's nice and snug and tight. And then I trim it off. Now, we're gonna finish this off, and traditionally, they would, the tires of the day, they probably use nail polish. Um, and today, a lot of people use head cement or varnish, and it works wonderful. The thing is that uh, um, head cement usually takes uh, a couple, three or four good coats to get that nice, shiny head. And um, one of the things that has hit the market that's really good is, is this, these UV resins. And the resins are, they're, they're, were originally designed for surfboard companies. Okay, we're just gonna paint it on the thread here. And it, it's bone dry, it dries very quickly. One coat is all you need. It's basically bulletproof. We use this torch, this UV light, and I, I get it so that it, it pulsates. And I just hit this nice and easy, rotate it back and forth. And it's about 20 seconds and it sets this whole thing up. The head is all solidified right there. And there you have it. You have a nice smelt pattern. You take a look at that. It's got some nice lines with it. You've got the teal with that barring and then you have your jungle cock eye. You can see your body slightly underneath it. When this gets wet, it's gonna really streamline down and you're gonna have a nice fly. We hope you enjoyed this episode of New Hampshire's Wild Side. Be sure to check back for new content at nhwildside.com. I'm Mark Beauchamp. And I'm Christina Lupi. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. To learn more about Life Outdoors and New Hampshire Fishing Game, check out some of these videos. And be sure to subscribe.